Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another exciting episode of the Beyond Jaws podcast. I'm your co-host, Andrew Lewin, here with my other co-host, Dr. David Ebert. Dave, how excited? Like, would you live in Honduras? Like, is that something? That, is that a place you would live in? I, you know, I've never been there, so I'd want to go. I'd probably go ch- and visit it first. I know the diving is spectacular, so right there, that's, I'd yeah, probably get a... Is. I'd probably seriously consider that with the diving. Don't don't know about the hurricanes though, but I might have to like you know go north during the hurricane season. But uh, but yeah, I could I could see yeah. being there part of the year doing some diving and and just kind of a, you know living live the island life there. So yeah, I mean what Absolutely. the heck? You know? And working with Ivy, I'm sure you guys oh. will get along really well. You seem to know each other no. for quite some time, and oh and, yeah, uh, already starting to talk about stuff to work together and go down there. And mm-hmm. I think that's uh, that's great. So. Dave, like, you know, we, we have Ivy. She's newly, newly PhD. Um, you know, she's been in the business for quite some time. You know, a lot of experience, you know, fisheries observer mm-hmm. and, um, you know, working for NIMS and National Marine, uh, National Fisheries, was it National Marine National, Fisheries, National Marine Fisheries Service. National Marine Fisheries, Fisheries Service. Service. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, for quite some time. And then, you know, really interesting how she, how she's going to be talking about her career and how that's changed. What are you looking forward to the most with this? Uh, kind of like, uh, kind of hearing about how she, well, I mean, kind of know a little bit, but how she wound up in Belize and how she's, she's had a lot of things going on. She's doing her PhD. She got married. She has a, a young son, um, living in another country. It's, it's going to be an interesting story. I just, I know she's, you know, I've, I've kind of like, and I've known her for quite a while, but it's going to be an interesting story how here and how she's gone from all these different places live in a different country and we're there, you know, Spanish is the main, the main language there. And she certainly didn't know Spanish when she arrived, but she's learned now no, exactly. and she knows how, and she knows how to communicate with the fishermen. So I'm looking forward and I hope everybody really enjoys it. Cause she's definitely had a, an interesting journey in her career and it's still going. She's just really getting started at this point. So, uh, I hope everyone enjoys the show and, uh, yeah, I hope you enjoy the show today. Yeah. Here's that interview with Dr. Ivy Barrymore. Enjoy. And we'll talk to you after. Hey, Ivy, welcome to the Beyond Jaws podcast. Are you ready to talk about sharks? I am ready to talk about sharks. <laughs> right well, on. Love it, love it. <laughs> well, welcome to the Beyond Jaws podcast today where we have a fabulous guest. We have the Dr. Ivy Barrymore, who's a real star in the shark world. And Ivy just finished her PhD just this past May at the University of Exeter. So we're really yeah. thrilled to have her on the show and be able to introduce this Dr. Ivy uh, now. Um, but before that, she did a <laughs> Bachelor's of Science degree uh, from the Florida State University. And before that, she did a, a Master's of Science degree actually at the University of Florida, which I didn't think in Florida, if you went to what, state versus university, yeah, that really could do that. The, man, the, the Gators, the Seminoles, that's, that's, that's horrible. <laughs> um, and so, and uh, for her Master's degree, she worked on the uh, Sand Devil, the Angel Shark, Squatina Dumarel. And between her uh, bachelor's and her master's degree, she also worked as a biological technician for the National Fisheries Service at the Panama City Laboratory for several years. And then went back and did her master's degree. And then after her master's, she went back and, and worked again for, uh, for the National Marine Fisheries Service, working in the Gulf of Mexico on the uh, shark pupping and nursery air. Uh, surveys. Uh, and then after doing that for a number of years, she moved to Belize to go work as a technician for the Mar Alliance, which is, uh, which is founded by our friend uh, Rachel Graham, who's been on the show in the past. Um, after working there for a number of years, she decided to start back part-time at the University of Exeter to working on her, working on her PhD, which I mentioned she just completed. And she, right now, she also does a lot of uh, work, was back working full-time, I presume, uh, as much as you can, being a, being a mom and, as well, to a five-year-old, as much as she can uh, with, the, with the Mar Alliance. And she's working with the, uh, also working with a lot of the deep water fishery surveys in the Meso- Mesoamerican region. Uh, Ivy enjoys working with people from diverse backgrounds and learning new ways of looking at complex program problems. And um, with that, Ivy, work, welcome to the program. Thanks very much. That is, yeah. it's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> You're very accomplished. Very accomplished. Um, Absolutely. We, so, we'll, we'll, like we always start off with, we want to find out like sort of what was your, how did you get interested in sharks and in the marine science? Um, I think I have a pretty common story. Uh, You know, a lot of people, when you talk to a kid, you know, around my son's age, um, you say, what do you want to be when you grow up? And they say, I want to be a marine biologist. Um, And that was me from from the very beginning. For a while, I wanted to be um, a marine biologist artist. Uh, But yeah, Um, but it turns out that I can't 
I can't draw anything. Like the little stick <laughs> fish is the best I can do. Uh, don't ask me to draw a shark. I can't do it. <laughs> um, so I quickly gave that up. And then I just kept on. I um, through, uh, under, you know, through all of my education, went to undergraduate, as you mentioned, at Florida State. Um, was able to do an internship at the National Marine Fisheries Service with John Carlson, as you mentioned. It's our one of our first connection. Um, and um, I actually, when I um, when I interned there, when I was still an undergraduate, my project was on mackerel, and uh, wow. and looking at the the otoliths, the ear bones. And so it was just a, it was a great internship. I I, I graduated from Florida State. Um, you know, still I didn't have I, at that time. I wasn't. Uh, I was trying not to be too narrow, so sharks weren't really on my my radar. But then I got a call from John, and he said, "Hey, I've got this this part time or this uh, you know short term job, and uh, you're graduating. We know that you we talked to Doug, who you worked with, and uh, we think that you might be a good fit. And you're you're graduating right when we need somebody. So why don't you come over and work with us for a bit? And that's how I got into sharks, essentially. Oh, okay. Um, so yeah, I started working okay. with the shark pupping and uh, nursery area group, and from there. Um, basically stayed with them for about 10 years. Okay. Wow. Yeah. Did, what areas were you working when you start off like working like in the, in the pupping areas, like just all in Florida or just all throughout the Gulf of Mexico? Uh, the Northern Gulf of Mexico. Right. So the, 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 I'll just call it NIMPS for short rather, rather than National Marine Fisheries Service. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So the NIMPS lab right. in, in Panama City, Florida, if you don't know Florida, I don't know if this is backwards or not, but it's the, it's the panhandle. It's a tiny little town. It's called the Redneck mm -hmm. Riviera. Uh, for a good reason, uh, and yeah. so it's a it's a small town, um, but there's a lot of the Apalachicola River is nearby um, yeah. that comes out into the Gulf, and so the um, area that we were working in were basically those little bays and estuaries around Panama City, so North Florida. Now, did you, did you grow up? Uh, did you grow up around the ocean? I did not. I was a landlocked kid. Um, but the best like two weeks of my year were um, at Dauphin Island, Alabama. Uh, my dad, oh, yeah, Island, my dad um, and a whole bunch of uh, extended family and friends came down for two weeks. And I think it was, well, one to two weeks. And we would stay in a beach house uh, for a week. And I would basically just come back like one giant sunburn <laughs> for just didn't leave the water. <laughs> Hair was like this and a big mat from just being in salt water all the time. Uh, but yeah, that was where I, I, I looked every year. I looked for shark teeth and I never found, I still have never seen, found a shark tooth on the beach. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I always we're, wonder that too, right? Everybody says they can find shark shark teeth and everything and they're all finding it. And then there's uh, the shark trust that does the great, you know, what is it? The, the great egg case. Uh, egg, egg egg case. case. Skating. Yeah. Search. Yeah. And I'm just like, where did people find yeah. these things? I've never, I've never seen these never been able to find any. <laughs> Okay, yeah. so I'm glad I'm not the only yeah. one. So, right. so, so, you, so, so you, you you grew up in a landlocked environment, and then you get, but you got interested by for that two weeks a year when your family would go down to Dolphin Island, you'd you would uh, um, just got really interested exactly, in the yeah. ocean, and then yeah, yeah, and and so that, is that why is that part of why you went to uh, Florida State because of the, your interest in the ocean or? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, so I, I grew up landlocked, um, and then my sophomore year in high school we moved to hawaii um so i had a big transition hawaii? from arkansas yeah like not Tough yeah life. not a, not a baby step like just full transition <laughs> yeah. um yeah. and so yeah. that of course i i had still had that interest i knew i wanted to i you know at that point i knew i wanted to be in marine biology um but then being in hawaii is just it's incredible um oh yeah gosh. so that really yeah. um helped to to motivate me even more being there um, and then when it came time to pick uh, a, an undergraduate university, um, it essentially, essentially came down to costs. It was going to be really too expensive to stay um, in Hawaii and be able to go. I would have had to move at home and I kind of was ready to, to get out. And um, so, yeah, that's how Florida State, because I had a, a really good reputation um, for having an, an undergraduate marine biology program. Um, mm. and, and so that was that's how I made my decision. Oh, okay. Okay. Did you, when you're just a curiosity, when you're in Hawaii, did you, did you ever go around any of the Marine facilities there or any, at all, or just any, do you happen to go check out any of the facilities there? Or? So the first department that we had, uh, when we moved there was in Kaneohe and, um, I was on the road where, um, you walk out and actually the, the university of Hawaii Marine station Island that's there. Oh, wow. It was like at the bottom of the, of the road. So I could see it. But I actually never, um, I, I did some interviews uh, just via email uh, with a few people, um, Kim Holland and things like that to, to gauge some interest. But, right. 
Um, but no, I didn't do any official. I, yeah, I was still, you know, 16, 17, you're kind of, you don't really understand how to, how things work. If I, you know, in retrospect, I really wish I had gone in and said, Hey, can I volunteer or done something like that? But I wasn't a super <laughs> yeah, you yeah. Know, social outgoing. Yeah. Okay. Well, it's intimidating yeah, okay. too. You see this big station, right? And it's in Hawaii and all these experts and here you are a teenager. I get it. That's, that's a hard thing to go up and just, well, can I volunteer? Yeah. Well, you met, you mentioned like Kim Holland, but you know, like I think Chris Lowe and Steve Kajura and that, that whole crew were kind of out there and that. Yeah. I don't think I time. was aware of that. <laughs> yeah. I, I just, I just thought I'd ask. I've, I've, obviously we had people have been on here like, yeah, I met so-and-so when I was in high school or somebody or, you know, something like that. So yeah. I don't know if you might've come across them when you were, when you were doing that. So uh, I said, anyway, I had to ask the question. So you, so you went off, went to uh, Florida state there and did, and did your, did you worked in your marine biology and, and then was it, were you still, uh, a, an undergrad when you started at, at the uh, nymphs or did you uh or was it just afterwards you, you yes you exactly so there. that was um one of so felicia coleman was the uh, the i guess the head of the sort of what they called the marine biology program so there wasn't an official major it was biological sciences but you could take the uh you know a few classes that were marine oriented um, and I, was it like a specialty? Yes, like, kind of. Like there was a certification. Yeah, yeah, at the time there was a certification gotcha. process. It probably has, this, this has been a long time. Um, so yeah. it's probably changed <laughs> since then. Um, but one of the options was an internship uh, in the summer months. And you got credit for it. You um, got nine summer credits uh, for doing completing an internship. At, and uh, they, at the time, were partnering with the National Marine Fisheries Service. Um, so, um, and then Michelle Passerati was the year, I think just the year after me, she came in and did the same internship. Um, oh, really? So after I started working. Yeah, exactly. Oh, yeah. Cool. Um, so, yeah, it was a great, it was, you know, because you, you, we had to, at that point, I was between my junior and senior year. And so it was three solid months of um, field work, lab work, working in a lab, like in the, the NIPS lab with everybody um, on a project that actually really needed to be done. Um, and, and I had to write essentially, it was a short thesis, but it was essentially a thesis. Uh, in order to get credit for for the um, uh, for the course, and um, you know it was just that's exactly the kind of training that you need in order to go, especially when you're thinking about graduate school. Is you know, it really mm -hmm. it's bit like you know I said as a teenager I didn't have any idea how any of this stuff really worked, but to get into a working environment and to see to be able to just completely focus on one project to see how it um, it gets integrated into the broader project into the importance of like what is important in fisheries science and, and marine biology. Um, that was mm -hmm. extremely formative and it was great. Yeah, great experience. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Oh, cool, cool. So, so, you, so when you finished up there, you, were, you, were you pretty much, when you finished up your undergraduate degree, did you, were you a contract employee still at that point or did you? Yes. Did you, and, okay, so you, you yeah. worked as a contract. And then, and then you, I mean, I, I obviously I know, it's, you know, NIMS is not always that easy to get onto is like, cause people think, Oh, I'll go to work for these guys. And, but a lot of the work is actually through contract. Uh, they contract people like yourself. So when the, yeah, you were, yeah, and you did that. So <laughs> when they're, yes, when the contract's up, so they has, can either like say you're done or not. Go ahead. So is that like a typical government thing? Like you'll start off as a contractor and you'll do like several contracts in a row as they have money and, and, and things for you to do. Is that it? Yes, um, essentially. And I never actually left as a con. I, I was there for, um, I did my master's degree in between. Um, so I worked for, I think it was two and a half years there, left to get my master's degree, came back as a contractor again under a different program. Okay. That was the, the fisheries observer program. And, um, mm -hmm. and then stayed on for another. So it was a, really a total of 10 years that I was there. And I was literally a year to year contractor. So every year, you know, it was like, well, <laughs> you've survived another day. You can go on to this. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. So, the, so would yeah. you, now would you get all like, I have to, cause we do this in, in, with our federal government in Canada. Like when I worked for fisheries and oceans where we would work as a, they called it temporary. So there was indeterminate terminate, which was like the temporary one. And there was like 
a contractor, like a consultant, and then and then they had like a ninety day sort of like very temporary. But I was on a year to year for quite a while, for about six years, and you would know sort of near the end of your year, you, you wouldn't know like in January. Our fiscal year was March, so by like the second last week of March or the last week of March, you'd be like, yeah, hey, guess what? We got approval for another year, but we got all like benefits and stuff, which was important when you were for the government. Was so was that similar to your experience when you did that year? Yes, day? exactly. Um, yeah, okay. so there were uh, we full benefits, um, not the same as the, the federal employees get, but um, that you're essentially hired on as a full time employee, um, and so okay. with that you get you get the the benefits along with it. And you know it's not it's it's not bad, um, and it's not meant to be a ten year <laughs> going on, but of course that's not. how with continuing resolutions and um, you know they um, yeah. not wanting to ex- expand the federal government. Uh, it's a way to make the yes. federal government actually appear yeah. smaller than it is, is by yes. having a lot of these yeah. es- essential jobs that are done by what are yep. essentially part-time, or not part-time, right. but not um, federal employees. Yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. It's an interesting, when, it's an interesting model. Well, that's for well, sure. when they had, when they had the, na- when they had the national shark research consortium, which I was part of, that was the same thing. It was like a year to year, like a continuing resolution, they'd sign off on it. And then when they just decide they didn't need it anymore, they just, oh, we're not signing it this year and you're out of luck. And um, so it's kind of a, you just never know on those types of programs. Now, now, I wanted to ask you, when you did your master's on the on the angel shark there in the Gulf, was that, was it connected in any way with the stuff you were doing with, with nymphs at all? Or is that just something you came up with on your own? Yeah, exactly. Um, I So I've been really lucky and it's it's been sort of how I've, Sort of bounce from uh, from degree to, to degree to degree and um, project to project is um, again same with the internship that I did getting gaining experience. That was another thing I didn't want to go straight into graduate school. Um, I, I wanted to get some work experience before I did that. And uh, so part of that um, and one of the things that was paying for my contract was um, the uh, they needed their they, NIPS needed data on some of their prohibited species and the angel shark. Uh, because there's, there was basically no information on the species, it was listed as prohibited because they couldn't say one way or another whether fishing was going to affect it. Uh, so they, uh, there was a need for angel shark data, essentially. And so I started going to, there's really, at the time, one fishery that was catching them, and it was a deep water trawl. Um, and so they were allowed to keep the angel sharks because, you know, as a big trawl comes on board, it's uh, they kept everything. They did. They retained everything that they, that they caught, um, unless, of course, they saw, they got a turtle. But you wouldn't at that depth, most likely. Um, and so, because of that, they just brought everything that they caught up to the surface, and they were allowed to keep prohibited species as long as there was a, a federal person or contractor who came and basically monitored it. And so, I went out there and basically started monitoring this, and then realizing that there was no biological data on the species, I would basically, as they offloaded the boat, go through and pick, like just grab angel sharks off the conveyor belt as it came on, uh, as they came through and then take them back and dissect them. And um, so when I, it came time basically to apply, um, I knew I was ready to go to to get a master's degree. Uh, It was basically just sitting on a gold mine of data. And so I was able to go, um, yeah, I was basically able to go to an advisor and say, I have this data set and all of this stuff is collected and really all I need to do is, is, uh, is analyze it and do a little bit more, um, you know, field work and, um, it's pretty much funded. Um, so yeah, that's, that's super attractive to, uh, yeah. to a professor. So, so, so you came a long way from your teenage years by getting this job. You went from not knowing anything about, <laughs> about doing anything in Hawaii to like, I'm going to collect data now. And then when I'm ready, I'll go do my master's. That's that's yeah. sweet. That's awesome way to awesome way to do it. Just to have everything kind of lined up like that. Um, so you went. So you got your master's. But it's also not. Your, but uh, no. Go ahead. Just to add ahead, on Dan. to that, Dave. Sorry, it's it's not all. It's also not easy to do. You know, just because you have a project in front of you like that you're working. I find like I've tried to do that before, and it's it's not an easy thing to go to a professor and be like, hey, look, this is funded. This is good. Like. You, it sounds easier than it looks because then the professor's like, well, how committed is this person to being able to do this? And like, will they go through like the coursework that needs to be done? And, and how was the university going to, you know, you know, almost kind of like get their cut or, or figure it out? You know, like it's a, there's a lot that goes into that. Um, and it's it's 
was it hard to navigate like when you did it or was it as easy as you kind of make it sound like just no. hey look i've got it all here and and do you want to accept no it? no that was definitely um there were a lot of moving parts and i got i got right. very lucky and um i also um you know had a lot of really good support um so john yeah. uh my my boss john and enrique i should i should not leave enrique out because he was instrumental in um all of this as well enrique mm -hmm. cortez um yeah and um so they were you know at the time that they're you know these are very well known, you know, scientists now. But at the time, yep. this was I'm gonna give it away about twenty years ago, um, before really Shark Week was like, or when it was still good, you know, still good. <laughs> yeah. um, and um, you know, so we were just the three of us, and and Dana Bethay was there. So there was, you know, it was like four of us, which, mm -hmm. like this little tiny group, and um, you know, they were really, they really wanted me to succeed, and so they gave me a lot of support and a lot of advice. Uh, so that's how. Uh, essentially, Deb Murray, who was my advisor for my master's, she came, she's a, a fisheries scientist, and she came to our lab uh, uh, to help out with some of the, you know, the bony fish uh, population assessment that was going on, stock assessment. And um, and so I was able to just informally chat with her while she was there, like over lunch. And, and she said, well, you know, I do have this money um, for a grant that I've got for a graduate student. You would need to do a, a research assistantship to pay um, so it, it essentially pays for your your tuition, um, but you have you are a full time student. You also work full time, uh, in your in your free time when you're not at cl taking classes and doing your own research. Um, and so she said, "Well, I'd have this. So let's you know let's stay in touch, and I'll let you know how it's going to work out." So yes, I was. She uh, basically I came in and helped her uh, with some of her other um, projects that she had going on that were funded, which uh, included freeze drying and then using a coffee grinder to grind up freeze dried oysters and clams oh, from the, from the Appalachian pole, mm. which I can tell you, it gets into your nasal cavities when it pulverizes. Mm. Um, yeah, yeah. So it's, mm. if you can imagine <laughs> that's, it doesn't sound no, fun. So, so there was some of that <laughs> and, uh, driving a boat for some of the, they did some uh, artificial reef work in the Gulf of Mexico. And mm -hmm. so it was, a, you know, it was a lot. Um, but she had this, she had this project that essentially paid for my, for my way through. And then I was able to bring my, my research project with me. So yeah, right. There's a lot of moving parts. It's not just like, Hey, yeah. I'm here. Let's go. Um, they have, you, people yeah. can't just take a student. They have to have money, uh, in order right. to take and a project for you, yeah. for you to do. Yeah. Cause there's like university rules against it, right? Like you have to pay the student a certain amount of money. So they have to be able to have that, um, you know that 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 in place yeah exactly to follow those yeah. rules yeah yeah and i and yeah. i well, well know, that's actually one uh, oyster yeah, go ahead. Yeah, oysters are important yeah, go ahead. um yeah. and i you know i like oysters but I, I, that wasn't my my interest at the time um <laughs> but yeah it was a it was um again having that work experience before and dana bethay was was there when i was uh, when i had just started she was doing her master's degree on um, doing a diet analysis it's kind of a it's actually kind of a seminal paper now. Um, she did diet analysis of four juvenile shark species, and I was there in the wet lab with her, helping her uh, conduct, you know, do all of her dissections and measurements and things. And I said, you know, I know one thing. I, you know, I don't know exactly what I want to do in my research, but I definitely don't want to do diet analysis because it's just terrible. <laughs> and guess, guess what? I did my master's on <laughs> <laughs> diet analysis of Atlantic angel sharks. <laughs> Yeah, I love it. I love it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was so after so you you went into that. So you we got got your master's, you got through there, and then you went back to work working at nymphs, and you're back in the shark field at that point. Then, and you were and you were back doing the were you doing the like, were you doing the pumping ground stuff still, or were you doing some of the other more observer stuff at that point? Observer stuff, right? So um, again, with contract work, you kind of take it where it, um, where it is, and and um, hope that you can sort of ride it ride the, the funding wave into um, a good, uh, you know, a good position. And so again, you know, it's like, John, hey, guess what? Um, I've got some funding for an observer uh, coordinator because we're just, we're going to be doing observer, putting observers out on uh, the commercial bottom long line fisheries. Um, so we need somebody that can, mm -hmm. can step in and basically be, the, so I came in as the assistant coordinator and I had, I had helped him with that a okay. bit before I went to graduate school. Okay. Um, yeah. And, yeah. yeah. So. And, and then, yeah. I was, and I was going to ask you, know, you, the program you're running there now, we, you, we, obviously we know this, that uh, Megan Witten, who was recently on the program, she came through 
Actually, I had several students, Lewis Barnett, Megan, and uh, Jenny Kemper all came through the program there. And could you talk, we talked a little bit about it on Megan's show, but could you talk a little bit about, because this was the kind of thing that if you're a young person coming up, I thought was a terrific, I thought was a terrific program because that you gained a lot of valuable experience, especially prior to going to going back to grad school. Could you talk a little, just a little bit about the program? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's um, yeah, it's, it's hard to, so my, when I came through as an intern, it was three months and it was a formal internship that was through the university. And I'm trying to remember actually if Megan and I think Jenny definitely was a formal internship, uh, but I can't remember if Megan was a, a formal internship or if she just came in um, sort of unofficially and, and stayed. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, yeah, so there um, we had, so the, at the time our program had, uh, had links with Florida State University but we also took on uh, sort of short and long-term interns. And again, it's kind of the same, you know, it gives you the, the opportunity for the same kind of experience that I had, which was, you know, being working with working scientists, working on actual real research projects for a, an agency that is, you know, arguably the most important man fisheries management agency, um, you know, in, in America. <laughs> Um, there's fish and wildlife, mm -hmm. of course they do, but for marine species, this is the, right. is like they do all the stock testing, especially for sharks. Um, and so you're, mm -hmm. you're there if you had, especially if you're a sharky kid and you just want to learn more about it, you can get literally like, with the observer programs, um, something that we set up that John, uh, really set up well at the time was, um, he made sure that not only were the, the fisheries observers that were on the boats collecting the data that they were federally mandated to collect, but they were also collecting biological data that was needed for the stock assessment. So we were able to work um, basically in real time and say, okay, well, Enrique is doing the stock assessment for this species. And he says that we need data on sandbar sharks. All right, guys, when you're out there, when you've got to, when they're landing these sharks, you've got to send us all the reproductive organs and the vertebrae so that we can do the age growth and reproduction on, on, on the species so that mm -hmm. the next time there's a stock assessment, we'll have updated biological parameters. And guess what? You know, it's the, again, we were a pretty small team. So a lot of those interns that came in for three to six months at a time were the ones that were physically in the wet lab with us. And so they got really mm -hmm. big hand, like literal hands on <laughs> hands yeah, in the gonads, uh, yeah. you know, uh, experience on, on that. And again, it's important to understand what the research is, what you what you like to do, what you're good at and what you may or may want to avoid. Um, I feel like that could be a shirt, though. Hands in the go net experience. <laughs> like I have hands in the go net experience. Yeah. Shark hands. You know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So yeah. So uh, so uh, so you you worked there for a while, and then what kind of like prompted you to decide like I'm going to go to Belize and go work with this group Mar Alliance? Yeah. That's a big change. It was a big change. That's um, big. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Um, so at that point, as I mentioned, I had been working uh, off and on for. For NIMS and the same and the Panama City Lab for about ten years, um, and it kind of reached as a contractor, and it essentially reached a point where um, there was nowhere up for me to go, um, mm. and so and there were no nobody there were no job openings or there weren't any federal positions that were being opened. So I you know I started essentially kind of looking around, and uh, the the thing with the contract is the way that it's written is the way that's written, and so you know. I, with 10 years of experience and a master's degree, I was basically had the same title as someone who had a bachelor's degree and less mm -hmm. experience and the same pay. Mm -hmm. And that's mm -hmm. just the way that the contract is written. It doesn't matter. Like there's no meritus, um, you know, moving no, up. Right. Doesn't um, go up. Yeah, like, unless like you yeah. would, like if you were part of a union or exactly. part of the, like the federal government where there's like steps yes, every exactly. year, right? And yeah. you know, the project is the project and it's no fault of, of anybody working there. Nope. It's just the, it's the system. Uh, so I started exploring yeah. options, and one of the options was was just to go. I was actually considering um, going back to get a PhD at the time. So this is ten years ago, um, and uh, or more than that, actually now, um, twelve years ago. Um, so <laughs> I I thought of um, going back to get a PhD and going into stock assessment because there's ah, certainly okay. jobs in stock assessment. Yes, um, that yes, was almost yes. guaranteed. Yeah. But in the U.S., when you go to get your PhD, it's it's four years of your life. Um, you can't mm -hmm. just sort of swan in and, and swan out. And um, I was really trying to leverage p the potential for doing like um, a PhD where I I'll still work with NIMS part time or something along those ways. I, I, I didn't want, I like the idea of getting a PhD just for the sake of getting a PhD and then having not right. having something yeah. at the end of that that 
would be anything better than what I had before I left. Exactly. Um, right. And so um, I, I think it was Toby Curtis uh, posted on Facebook that like, hey, this is a, a pretty cool job. Um, and it was uh, actually before Mar Alliance was even um, formed yet. It was uh, Rachel Graham. Mm -hmm. It was uh, she was still with the yep. with WCS. And so she posted a job mm -hmm. for um, for a position down in Belize. And I read the terms of reference and I was like, well, it's I can do that. <laughs> um, so I, yeah, so I just applied from a, you know, something that I saw on Facebook and uh, had a great interview with Rachel and thought, you know, if things don't work out, I can always come back. Um, and that was yeah. in 2012. <laughs> but that, that was in 2012. Yeah. That's so that's a big, big move. Like that's a, a that's a life changing, like altering, altering move. Um, what were the concerns that you, that you had like doing that. Um, so the funny thing is that I had just gotten married. Um, like we got married in December, actually, so it would have been 2013, right? Um, and then yeah. I moved in April of the following year. Right. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and I, as you mentioned, uh, we were talking before, David asked, you know, is, is Simon living with you now? Because for a while we did this, I was in Belize and he would come down for a few months and then go back and he was working with the, you know, the same program, the Fisheries Observer Program. Um, right. So he'd go back and make some money and then come down and, and, um, and hang out with me. Um, so that was a big consideration. Um, we didn't have kids um, at the time, so that was easy. You know, it, was a, it wasn't yeah. something that we had to yeah. worry about mm -hmm. with schools or anything like that. Um, and, you know, it was just um, at the time, you know, I was a little bit disenfranchised with um, the work that I had been doing before. Again, it was a great, mm -hmm. I was super lucky in my job. I really loved working with John and Enrique and the rest of the team. Um, but, you know, there wasn't much of a future to it. Um, right. Uh, to to really expand. And I, and I was really, I was very flexible in the research that I could do. I did a lot of really great um, projects and, mm -hmm. you know, I, I enjoyed it, but I, I kind of reached the end of it. So I was, you know, I was feeling a little bit of like a, you know, a little, it was like a crank, like plug in the data, turn the crank. So come, yep, coming sure. to Belize was yeah. like, oh, this is a new and exciting, like I can actually apply my skills yeah. to something that is new and interesting and, uh, and totally different and a totally different set of problems that need to be solved. And, yeah, it was a it was mm -hmm. a bit of a it was a it, a bit of a change. <laughs> a lot more creativity in the projects too that you can do as well, right? It's, it's not like government is very like here's you could do something for like thirty years, do the same project over and over, and be able to accomplish a lot over that time. But it's like you said, it's like a crank. You just you got to turn the day, you got to follow the protocols, and maybe expand on them a little bit here and there. But for the most part, it's the same thing. Whereas you go and work for a nonprofit organization as exciting as Mara Lawrence, and then you're like, oh, okay, well, I'm in a tropical country, you know, it's a very different lifestyle, yeah. and then be able to be able to do that. Now, I think that's that's really cool. I just wanted to ask a question, just to go back to the the decision for a PhD. Now, were you doing the PhD while you were at Mara Alliance? I was, yeah. Or did that happen? Yeah, after? so um, I can't. I, so I moved down to Belize um, and. Uh, got started, like I just got, we immediately went out to Lighthouse Reef Atoll, which is this gorgeous atoll in the middle of the ocean. It's far away from nowhere. I did um, kind of, you know, trial by fire, learned the ropes on how you, how you can conduct research in a, in a remote location and logistics and, and all those sorts of things. Um, and then, um, and then it just became like overwhelmingly, uh, you know, just data fire hose all the time, like yeah, going out and yeah. collecting, collecting data. And then, Rachel started Mar Alliance the year after that. And so it was like, okay, so there was another, we had a year um, and then it was like another, you know, another leap. Like, uh, uh, you know, are we going to, so we made the year and now it's starting from scratch again. And, you know, it's a new organ, it's going to be yeah. a brand new organization. It was like, well, let's see what, let's see how it goes. Um, see yeah. how we can, mm -hmm. how we can get it going. Um, so Rachel started Mar Alliance. I was on the, the you know, in the first uh, people that went with her, um, there just a couple of us at the time. And uh, so, yeah, and then she came to me and said, you know, I want you to have something that you, you know, it's great that we're doing all this work and we do a lot of really cool work with um, with baseline, collecting baseline information. And uh, she does a lot of satellite tagging whale sharks. And she's like, I want you to yeah. find something that you're passionate about. And I said, well, you know, deep sea fisheries are pretty cool. That's what I did my master's on. I'd like to maybe see what's down here because we really don't know um, what's, yeah what's going on. We don't know. We know, um, you know, she works with a lot of, um, the fishing community, a lot of fishers, 
So she had been sort of keeping an eye on the deep water fisheries that were sort of just starting out in Belize at the time. Um, mm -hmm. But we didn't know really what species they were, what they, you know, what depths they were at. And so, um, so that was the sort of the beginning of that. She said, okay, well, let's start putting in for, for grants and let's, let's go. So um, we started the, uh, looking into the deep water fisheries, trying to catch sharks and, and catching the snappers. And I, could, I think it was just last year that I finally figured out that I had been misidentifying one of the fish that I was looking at for, for oh, the no. time. It's good. <laughs> Got it out before the paper was out. Um, but the, um, you know, we just, there's just so little information um, that it was just yeah. every time it comes up, it's like, oh God, what's that? <laughs> um, yeah. And so that that kind of went on, and then um, as things go, um, Mar Alliance has been where we've got a decade in now. Um, you know, we're going strong, and so you know, it's like now we need, you know, in order to grow the organization more, we need more PhDs. We need more, you know, we need people in other in higher places, and there, you know, so there's opportunity to to move up. Um, you know, we want to be working with a lot more students and bringing those on. So, um, you know, it was basically given the opportunity to start a PhD again on the data that I've already collecting as part of my job. Um, but this time I actually didn't have to, to leave my job. I just continued to work full time right. and then did a part time PhD uh, with the University of Exeter. Um, and that's been a really good experience. It took a little bit longer than it probably would, you know, if I'd gone full time. Mm -hmm. But um, I was able to essentially... What was really nice about it actually is that it was because it's a the you have to do it as a thesis. It was it right. not enabled me to really like laser focus on mm -hmm. a few projects uh, and really make a story out of the thesis. So it was like that's what's great about working in academia. Uh, you know, in the NGO, you know, as an NGO and a, a nonprofit, we're just kind of like putting out fires and and we need data on this, we need data on that. But, but you know, having somebody yeah. who said, okay, here's the big picture and we're going to start from here. We're going to work our way here has been, makes a yeah, difference. it makes a big difference. So, um, so that was great because I was able to really, um, you know, had a, a goal and a time frame and, and all those sorts of things to get that done. So it, it worked okay. out really well for me. And, and it's, I think it's really important that people recognize that there's not one path that you need to take. Um, I wouldn't have gotten yeah. a PhD if I, if there wasn't like, I, you know, it's a way for me to advance my career. I think a lot of young people think that they just need a PhD and they don't really yep. know why. hundred percent. They go right from like undergraduate, they'll may, maybe do a master's or they'll go right to a PhD thinking that this will give them the best opportunity, but it might not give them the best opportunity may over qualify them for some jobs that they might want. Mm -hmm. uh, or they may just say, well, I don't want to actually do a job in this area. That, that I just did my PhD in, right? So that's a good question for that I was going to ask too, like in terms of going back to do a PhD, there's the advantage of really figuring out what you want to do and how it can benefit your career, but it also takes up a lot of time in your career. You were able to do it, you know, you know, with your job, which is, which is really great, but it took you away from other projects. And how do you see, like, you know, you kind of said the reasoning why you went back, but, um, how do you see it really helping you in this regard? I guess because as the, as the, is it because as Marlines kind of evolves, you said that the higher positions, it'll, it'll be beneficial to you. Is that the reason or were there any other reasons why you did it? Yeah, that's, I think, honestly, a, a PhD is a means to an end. Um, it's not, it, it's, I mean, I did, but not to everybody, to, to me, it is. Right. <laughs> um, and like I said, I never wanted to have a PhD just for the sake of having a doctor, um, yeah. Honor right, of course, um, yeah. but some people do and that's fine that you know that's what yep. if that's your motivation that's great you know you should, that that's different strokes for different folks that's that's how um but that's how <laughs> yeah. you know i how i operated um and it yeah. worked for me and you know also like i was saying i you know i have a now a five-year-old um and so being able to work to do to work full-time but also get my phd um it allowed for it allowed for flexibility and um and income um, yeah. while I was getting that done. Yeah. Now you did it, you did it remotely and you did it through the University of Exeter. Could you, could you, could you talk a little bit about how that, how that experience was for you? And I, I guess, first of all, how'd you get onto University of Exeter of all the places you could, you could do it? Yeah. And then um, I like to just see yeah, how that'd be an interesting story. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, so, we have worked, uh, we, ha we had several master students uh, who came from the University of Exeter and did their theses with us. And they've been 
Rachel ha has a pretty strong connection. Um, she's been, she was done like bass beam sharks and all of the, the whale sharks and all the satellite tagging um, has been with a lot of the spatial ecologists at, at the University of Exeter and um, and turtle stuff as well. Um, Brendan Godley and um, and then Matthew Witt with, and Lucy Hawks um, doing a lot of the, the spatial um, ecology. So a lot of them, um, at, I think we had up to three students at a time that would come in the summer and, and collect data with us. And then they were able to take that and data that they collected with us and turn it into a thesis. Um, so similar um, to the sort of the NIMS internship, but with the with graduate students. And so we already had that connection. It was already pretty, pretty well established. And um, so I just started chatting with Matt Witt. Um, he, his interests are in his, his specialty is not, not exactly what I was doing, but he's a really super um, great supervisor, really nice, great person to work with. And so we just kind of realized that there was a good opportunity there. And um, he also helped um, because there's a, so the PhD is, a, you know, at the end of the day, when you had your PhD, it's, you have it, but different parts of the world um, go about obtaining the PhD in a very different way. Um, so the, mm -hmm. the US and can Canadian system is very different from the European and English. Um, and Australian as well, I think. Um, so typically in the in the U.S., you go, you have you. There are certain number of courses you have to take. You have to be you have yep. to be there. Usually, you're either as working as a teaching on a teaching assistantship or a research assistantship. So you work for the university um, for a stipend, uh, and so you physically have to be there for, however, you know, three a minimum of three years, I think. Um, the English system, um, they. Most the typical student is still on campus and they are still um, there, but they actually there's no requirement for classes. They don't really have mm -hmm. other than professional development courses. They don't really have um, you can go and take courses that are for the, at the master's level. But if you already have your master's degree, then you don't have to actually take any any courses. Um, now you can and you can seek out other opportunities and, and get funding through the university to, to get those, um, those the things that you need to complete. Uh, your research, but um, and then the other thing is they don't have um, the the qualification exams and they don't have the computation exams. So there's no calls and comps. Um, you just show up to your viva <laughs> when you're ready, and it's essentially like a defense. But it's you don't actually have to even present your thesis. They just read it, and then um, so it's a very different system, um, and it worked okay. a lot better for me. I knew I, I financially, job wise, like Mara, you know, yeah. everything. I could not go leave to to get a phd so right um yeah that was yeah. it yeah it's the hard thing to do when you're especially when you're mid-career yeah. right and you're you're working so the, yeah, yeah the difference there is that with the u.s at, at, you know the, the the pro on that one um not the only pro but one of the pros on on the u.s phd is that you usually you know, almost always are there on some kind of an assistantship so you are getting the funding yes um, and your tuition is generally right. covered under that it's not very much <laughs> not much to live no. on but it's covered whereas the english one while you definitely can get funding to, to pay for your fees, it's not, uh, most of it is kind of, you, you just kind of pay the money for the, for gotcha. the yeah. tuition. And so, um, yeah, so I was able to get a discounted, um, the base get a scholarship, but I still had to pay uh, tuition every semester basically to, um, mm -hmm. to complete it. And you didn't have to be there necessarily. You could stay home. How did that work out? Because you said, you know, in the UK, a lot of times the, the student has to be on campus. How did you work out the, the way of not being on campus? Um, yeah, that much? was just um, because it was a part time and I lived abroad. They um, they gave me uh, leeway for that. So everything was was based online. And then, you know, I just had to do the, the, the ethics um, things for my basically everything was online. Um, and right. then and then all of we were, we have you know you had mandated check-ins with your so there's you had certain things that you have to do so um you're supposed to have i think monthly check-ins with your supervisor so we did those online and um and then uh every you have to checklists and and then halfway through you you upgrade um from being in fill to a phd standard okay. i think um Yep. Yeah. So there's also, you know, there are checks and balances along the way, but it's basically all, especially these days. Now everybody's so used to Zoom and yeah, everything else yeah. that it really was not too terrible. Well, and it probably helped during COVID. You didn't have to actually be on campus. You didn't have to worry about any disruptions yes, exactly. in, in the way you did the yeah. work, right? Yeah. And also, did, I'm just kind of doing the math in my head, but didn't about the time you started this, you had your son? 
Yes, I did actually. Um, yeah, exactly. How'd that work yeah. out? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I mentioned that we were in Belize, and then I and I said that right. we moved to. So I, I don't think I have actually. I so I moved to Belize, um, and then was there for I think about seven years working out uh, in San Pedro, and then that was when um, sort of 2018 I think was when I uh, really pulled the trigger on deciding to go to get it, to pursue a PhD. Um, got it, was accepted, got, got the scholarship and then I got pregnant. <laughs> and so I basically went, you know, to, to my, um, to this, my supervisor and, and said, um, so our timeline might be a little bit funny on this. And he said, you know, don't worry about it. Well, you know, yeah. it's, it's fine. Life happens. Um, yeah. so yeah, so I, you know, again, I've been, I've been really, really lucky. Um, so we actually went to Mexico, um, to have the baby. They have a, a really great healthcare system there. So we went, we lived in Playa Carmen for, um, about six months. Um, okay. and yeah, so, um, he, my son was born there and then took my maternity leave. And then basically at the end of the maternity leave moved, uh, where I am to right now, which is actually in, uh, Roatan, Honduras. Wow. Yeah. So, that's so yeah. Cool. I mean, that's, that's, yeah, I, that's, that's quite an interesting chain of events there why getting into your phd having having a given birth to a baby and then moving back to from going from belize to mexico then to honduras and why why i guess why why honduras versus back to belize um so um there was a we were having a bit of a transition uh around uh, like a lot of things happened around the same time so sort of the end of 2018 um we the Belize office actually, we didn't close the program. We just closed our office. Rachel moved to Panama, which is where she is now. Yep. Um, mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. I, we had already been planning to move here um, to basically mm-hmm. uh, try to get the program in, uh, here in Honduras um, bumped up a bit. And gotcha. also because my PhD research was on the deep sea fisheries, I had already been collecting data in Belize for uh, several years at that point, And we were kind of starting to realize that there was some interesting differences between Belize and Honduras. Um, so I had, uh, okay. I came here a few times and was, um, we realized that there was a lot of potential to, uh, to some really interesting contrast, um, countries that are basically like right up next to each other, um, to, mm-hmm. uh, do some really interesting research, but it would be easier if I was actually physically based here, uh, rather than having to right. go back and forth, even though it's, um, they're really close. It's actually kind of difficult. It's not difficult. It's expensive to get back and forth all the time. Um, right. So we had, you know, sort of planned a transition and then, um, uh, we basically had to push that back a, a little bit. Um, I had actually, I found out I was pregnant right literally, I think a week before the sharks international conference that was in Brazil. Um, okay. and yeah. Yeah. So everybody kind of met yeah. up uh, at that point. And um, that's when we, you know, we had been planning to, to move here. And I had to sort of say, well, um, we might have to wait on that a little bit before we move. Um, and yeah, so then, so once we got here and reestablished everything, um, you know, got, re- got uh, into the office and like ready and, ha- you know, figuring out how to do the stuff with the baby and everything it was uh, right after that was when the pandemic hit. Uh, <laughs> um, and so that again, so we had an office here and then we, we had to shutter that office as well to cut, to, to save money essentially. So we didn't have to pay rent. So now um, that's when I transitioned to working from home full time and I've been working from home full time since then. Now I have to ask, um, you know, you started off in, in Arkansas and now you're living on an island in Honduras. Um, how's that transition been? Because even like in Belize, you know, you have the mainland. There's there's a lot of uh, a lot of utilities that are around that you may not have on an island. So how do you find that contrast for to, to raise a family uh, and your husband's with you now, like, you know, living with you now. So how is that, that transition for you and your family? Um, yeah, it's been, um, the transition from Belize to Honduras was a, was a lot easier. Um, it's pretty mm. similar. I was in San Pedro, which is also an island. Um, the funny okay. thing about being um, a marine biologist, at least in the career, the trajectory that I have been on, um, is that I, you always end up living in a tourist trap. 
So Panama, Rest yeah, when peace. I started, I was in Panama City. And so we had the spring breakers. Um, and yes, that's you true. Know, so it's, you that's know, right. the pros and cons there. Um, and and the Canadians in the in the winter time. Yeah, <laughs> you get our snowbirds yeah, exactly. in the in the winter. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so then uh, and then I was in San Pedro in Belize, and that's a big tourist uh, destination as well. And now um, and now I'm in Roatan, which is uh, we get you know some days we get five cruise ships in a day on this mm. little island. Um, mm. So yeah, there um, I'm al- so I've always been in some place for it, which is a high tourism demand uh place so in that case it's not that big of a of a difference but yes um right our our interview was uh our podcast was delayed because yesterday we had a power cut for a very long time um <laughs> and so getting used to that is you know we have i think we probably have about uh i don't want to knock you know i don't want to jinx this <laughs> could cut out any minute. we probably have yeah, a, yeah, right? as you're saying yeah. it boom we we have probably on average two good power cuts a month um and, uh, you know, the internet can go, uh, like the internet was down for a week and a half because a banana fell on the line and nobody could find um, where the fault was. <laughs> we finally had to go with a machete and find it. Um, you know, but my, what I love though is um, uh, every Friday, just about every Friday, um, my son and his friends and their parents, we all get together and go to this uh, little beach bar that where the sun goes down and the kids swim, jump off docks. There's this boat that's anchored off that um it's like an old sailboat that the kids like rope swing off of and you know nobody's um the, you know the kids get to grow up kind of what i like to say the way that i grew up in the 80s there's not as much over supervision there's a lot i'm not going to say there's no tablets and no screen time um but you know there's a lot yeah. more opportunity to just be sort of kids um that are yeah. Yeah. not necessarily be under a roof all the time and i i, I value that right. for is growing up and he's in a school that's bilingual and um you know he has kids he has friends that only speak spanish and he he has learned to to speak spanish and um yeah. he snorkels we, we went snorkeling um my sister was here last week and we went um snorkeling and they had uh there were nurse sharks there and he came up and said sharks and then he swam down as close as he could get to them like he's you know he's <laughs> that's awesome that is so cool um, so yeah that's being able cool. to have those experiences that's... with him and being able to he's you know he's a really fantastic swimmer he loves to go he he's learning to use the snorkel now like we, you know we have a great time mm-hmm. that's awesome yeah. it's it, such a different it, way of growing up too right yeah. like it's so yeah. completely yeah. different it, now, did, now, did you, do you know Spanish now? Because obviously Belize was English, but did you learn, learn Spanish when you went to or Honduras or how'd that go? <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I, I understand. Yeah, no, I, I so yeah. Belize is funny because, yes, it's an English speaking country. A lot of people don't realize that. Um, but there's a lot of Spanish speaking, but people speak English to me no matter what. Um, we When we lived, actually, Mexico is the best for my Spanish because everybody calls you on the phone. They won't take, you know, so you have to panic talk Spanish when people, somebody is delivering the food or coming in to install right. the cable or do whatever it is. Um, uh, and here in the Bay Islands, um, it's actually sort of like Belize. It's the, the country of Honduras is an officially it's a Spanish speaking country, obviously, but the Bay Islands right. um, has a very interesting history. Um, and a lot of it is a lot of the um, people who are from here speak English. They, you know, they came from Cayman hmm. via England. So there's a Spanish okay. speaking element. There's an English speaking element. Um, and again, people speak, they speak English to me mostly. So it's harder for, uh, yeah. it's harder to be, to be immersed. Um, but when I'm on the boats right. with the fishermen that I work with, um, they uh, most up uh, here, most of them speak Spanish. And so that's actually what's best for my, for learning Spanish. I can talk about fishing in Spanish pretty well. <laughs> there you go. How, how does it, how does it work now? Like with your, Obviously, you got a young son who's five now. Like, are the schools, as far as the schooling and that kind of stuff, uh, how is that? Is that going to cause anything in the future? Or are they going to be? Is he be able to get get a good education going up? I'm trying uh, to find. Yeah, yeah. No, sorry. I was just looking to see if his diploma wasn't. Yeah, no. Um, he. It's been. We've been again. We've been lucky. We. Um, I really did think that our time might be limited um, here in Roatan because of uh, a lack of educational sources um, or quality education, but um, we've gotten into a fantastic program. And again, like I mentioned, he's, it's a bilingual school. They, they teach everything in English one day and then everything is in Spanish the next day. Um, mm-hmm. there, there are very good schools. He's in a, a kindergarten class, a very small one actually, um, it's like 
five other kids. Um, oh, cool. Yeah, and um, and he's because it's a small class, they can they they're if they're interested in something, they teach them about it. So he yeah, he's getting a he's getting a, a very good education, um, and great. I don't see that changing through the next few years. I think it's going to be yeah, it's been great. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, that's good. Yes, yeah, that's, that's one of those things I'm sure people are kind of at home, especially younger people that might be on a similar career trajectory. Like when you're living in some countries, like how is that going to work out if they have a family and stuff like that? So that's, mm-hmm. I'm sure a number of people thinking about that uh, going forward and stuff. And so I got, so now your husband's kind of in the same field as well. And like, so what's Simon doing now? Uh, now that he's living down there. <laughs> And we're gonna we'll have to have on the podcast. We're Absolutely. gonna definitely have on the podcast yeah. in the future. So yeah. So um, but let but kind of how's that? What's how's he doing down there? Yeah, he's doing great. Um, so I, I he um, uh, I guess for the listeners who don't know, <laughs> Simon Gulak is my is my <laughs> husband, and his his background is and um, is really similar to mine. He was a fisheries observer, so actually I was his boss back in the day before okay. we started. Before You're we started his day. boss. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> um, the truth comes yeah, out. A long, it was a long time. We weren't dating at the time. Um, so he, and then he worked at the, in the same lab and uh, transitioned into the fisheries observer program um, as a, uh, in a supervisory role. So when we were first married, I, I mentioned we, he were going, he was coming back and forth. And so he was working full time. Um, so he started a consultancy um, called C. Lucas, um, and has basically since uh, the last since we've been here, he's been doing work with uh, some of the local uh, NGOs, the, the Marine Park and, and others, to help them set up their monitoring system. So there's uh, it's a smart. So he basically contracts with them. Yeah. So yeah. Um, it's a system that a lot. It's great because it's free. It's um, it's uh, uh, you know open access, and you can uh, they have rangers on boats here that are basically patrolling because we live in a marine park, and. Um, mm-hmm. But it's it, it uploads to via satellite, and you need in order to do everything you need. You you basically you need somebody with some good software and hardware background, and that's what he's got. So mm. he is essentially helping a lot of different um, organizations to set up their smart, and then doing a he's doing other little projects on the side as well. That's yeah. awesome. So, I got it. So, so 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 his consulting business is called C Lucas. Is that what you said? Yeah. Yeah. Is that after just so S-E-A. people don't know? I assume it's Carcharinus Lucas, which is the bull shark. Yeah. Exactly, it's S E A. I thought you might like that. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I th- I think it's kind of I, I picked right up on that one. I just wanted to make sure other people, in case, just in case they might have missed <laughs> I that. I did not. Uh, I did not. Oh yeah, yeah. I picked right up. I've all this freaking shark nerd book guy. Um, <laughs> what else am I going to do? Um, so, you know, so, 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 like so you sound like you got a pretty. You what? Oh, there I was you go. Just pointing out. No, I think so it's you got there. your. I think I'll see what it is. Oh, okay, okay, okay. So, so you're doing. Doing um, so, you got all this. You got you got you got your family life going there. You got your career going. What's kind of like? What's the future look like for you as far as what's your? Where do you plan to go? <laughs> Don't from ask me here? that question. <laughs> <Uh-oh>. <laughs> no, I'm okay. No, no, it's great. Um, um, I, I'm just ha- you know I'm I just finished my PhD, so it's like now what's next? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, no, now you have time. No, yeah, exactly. Now you actually have more time on your no, hands. No, <laughs> yeah. So my PhD was in deep water fisheries. Um, it started out because I really wanted to, honestly wanted to see what sharks there were, but we kept catching these annoying fish. And um, at the end <laughs> yeah. of the day, I had a lot more fish data than I had shark data. Um, and it, also there's a lot of um, urgent need for fish data because that's what people are actually fishing for. They're, there's not a huge demand for sh- at the moment. Um, well, right where we are in Belize and, and in Honduras for, for deep water sharks. Um, mm-hmm. So, uh, the, but there's a lot of, the fishery is growing in Belize um, and it's pretty well established um, here. And so those data were really needed and I had a lot of it. So I was able to really, like I said, turn that into um, a really nicely streamlined PhD. With, um, but now that I've finished that, I really would like to get back to sharks. <laughs> <laughs> I'm tired of looking at, at otoliths. <laughs> so uh, what, yeah. what, what type of research are you doing, like, or what type of work are you doing with Mar Alliance now that you've finished your, your PhD and, and able to focus more on other projects? Um, yeah, so I, I, um, my role is technical coordinator, and I'll be um, moving into more of a science um, coordinator role in the, you know, over the next couple of years. Um, 
and so yeah, the, the idea is that I'll be able to sort of take over at helping to to steward our our um, our, our research um, and right. supervise a lot of the students and um, and researchers and and um, all of our local teams. So I was in Belize and I'm in, I'm in Honduras. We also have a team in Panama, which is where Rachel is. Um, and, um, you know, we work in se several countries across tropical countries. We've got programs and people and students and local students and foreign students and um, a lot of local teams. And so um, the idea is that I'll be able to, to um, basically sort of help get that all that science moving um, and keep it going. Um, so, yeah, I'm looking forward to that. And um, that's yeah, it's going to be great. It's it's. Um, something that I'm really looking forward to. So going less yeah, from well, the, the, te the technical logistical side to being more of the, the big picture um, side. Mm -hmm. Well, so, so this has been a, f a fascinating interview with you, Ivy. So what, what advice, I got we always ask questions, what advice would you have for someone starting out like that might be on a similar career trajectory or something? What advice would you have for, for someone? Uh, yeah, so it was something I always say, um, and it's, uh, what, what's worked for me is um, it is if you have I, if you have the opportunity to, opportunity to work in your, the field before you go for a higher degree I, I think it's important um, I was lucky that my you know in my early in my career I was able to do an internship the thing is I had I was able to do that because I was able to to live and pay for that um, so it's not as easy for people who don't necessarily have the the means to just take time out of their lives um, to just work for free. So if in that case, you know, volunteering and interning is great, but there are also opportunities if you are an undergraduate student and you're already in, um, you know, on your path and taking your courses, go to your favorite professor and say, hey, do you have anything in your lab? Do you have any graduate students that need help with their projects? Um, when I was doing my master's, I had a couple of undergraduates that came in and helped me smell up the entire facility with all of my sharp stomachs um, and they all went on to say that we're never going to do diet studies ever again as well um, but th there's lots of opportunities for you um, to to find these um, find work experience so whether it's uh, in under while you're an undergraduate I think it's important because again you get you see how a laboratory works you see how research starts out the middle of a research and how it ends how you actually get these projects off the ground um, but if there are other paid internships that you can do, I, you know, those are the those are ones to seek out as well. And you know, you find that organizations that offer paid internships uh, tend to, uh, that, you know, they have more uh, support for a lot of, for for people who can who don't necessarily they can be a lot more flexible a lot of times. So if you need a part time job while you're doing that that research, then you can um, you can make that work. Um, I, yeah, I don't, mm -hmm. you know, we, we, uh, in our organization, we, um, we take on local students and, and interns, uh, but for foreigners, we require that they have at least six months and they have their own fund, you know, funding, whereas we will, we do have um, programs to pay for local interns and, and um, doing and thesis students and things like that from local, um, local universities. So it's, uh, you know, something to be mindful for. It is, um, it is a little, it's difficult. It's, a, it's skewed towards people who have the means to be able to do mm -hmm. those sorts of, you know, volunteering. Um, but if you yeah. can find, there are ways, there are ways to get that experience early in your career. Um, and if you're, if you're stuck, you know, you find somebody that, you know, a lot, you know, I hate, you hate to say it, but it really is about who, you know, we've been talking about the same people, you know, in this, uh, right. during this podcast and, and, those are the people who got me where I am because I, I met them when I was doing an internship and they remembered me uh, because, and brought me on. And then they helped me to get a position in another place and helped me to get a position with, um, you know, in graduate school and things like that. So making those yeah. connections, um, you know, it, there are undergraduates that can go to the conferences. If you can, if you get in with a professor, you know, you can go and, and potentially present a little project and then you meet tons of people. Um, in the field, and so making those connections is really important. I was going to say, I, I think you, I think you and I first met when you were an undergraduate, I believe. I think so. Right. Exactly. Yeah. 
You, I met yeah, you and Dana. I met. I remember you guys. I think were under undergrads, and John introduced me to you, as I recall. So it's Is that was that the we won't uh, say the how Sun, long ago Sun that Bowl? was. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, we won't we won't talk about how many years ago, but it's been a while. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but I do remember meeting you early on. So uh, anyway, Ivy, thanks so much for coming on and joining us today. It's been an amazing interview. Really, I knew it'd be a good one having you on here to talk <laughs> about your journey and. and uh, <laughs> Um, I learned a few things myself I didn't even know about you, and I've known you for a long time. But anyway, <laughs> thanks again very much for coming on. Thanks and, for having uh, me. I really appreciate it. Thanks. Yeah, it's been great. Yeah, nice to thanks talk to you. Thank you, Ivy, for joining us on the Beyond Jaws podcast. It was great to have you on. Dave, like, imagine, you know, you know, Ivy, I feel, is living every marine biologist's life. Whether you're a shark scientist or not, you you want to live in the tropics. You want to live on an island at some point when you mm -hmm. decide – uh, you know, to follow a marine biology career. Was that something that was ever on your mind as you grew up, you know, uh, like getting your career intact? I think I think everybody, was, when you start out, you, you imagine living on a tropical island, beautiful coral reefs, um, you know, pretty fishes, and, and, of course, you know, doing some science on sharks or whatever you happen to be interested in. But I think everybody has that that vision of wanting to do that at some point in your career. Um, and, and we've had, a, just certainly had some other guests on there that that's, that's, that was their trajectory, but it seemed like for a lot of people, it, that's still that, that Island life. I know it, it is for me. It's still, it's still elusive. <laughs> so I haven't found it and I, <laughs> I'm pretty sure. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, it's, it's, yeah, she's like living the dream in a lot of ways. I think for a lot of people living the dream, being, being in a, uh, being on an Island, beautiful tropical Island and, uh, doing what she likes to do. Yeah, and I mean, you know, as she was doing the interview, looking out into the ocean, like being able to see it from her, from her mm -hmm. office, you know, which is she works out of her home, and and being able to be have access to that, I think it's it's really great. Uh, obviously, there's advantages and disadvantages. We mentioned earlier hurricanes, and you're living yeah. the island life. The day before we were supposed to do the interview, and her internet got cut, and her power got cut. So obviously, there's some challenges in living that island life. It's a little slower, which is kind of probably good for all of us, uh, you mm -hmm. know, to have that little that more of a slower lifestyle but uh definitely some advantages and disadvantage of living the, the the island life but working for an organization like mar alliance has got to be something special you know uh, we've had rachel graham on the podcast before uh, she, she's obviously amazing the organization's amazing it's yep. huge in you know the tropical countries especially in that mesoamerican uh reef area um, you know, I, I just can't say enough things that like that are, that are, that are uh, good enough to like to really give it its credit um, because it's mm -hmm. just so it's so great. So um, you know, you've 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 known Rachel, you've known Ivy for quite some time, and, yep. and Mar Alliance since its inception. Um, you know, what would you have to say about about them? Well, I think we I think what I'd have to say about it is I think you and I need to be invited down there and go do a podcast from from Roatan and maybe we can pop down and do one from uh, Panama with Rachel where she's based there. So, yeah, that's what I would think is like, hey, so uh, uh, Ivy, if you're listening to this and Rachel, um, give us a shout out. Andrew and I are like prepared to like, you know, rough it and go down and spend a few days on the island yeah. and do some do some in the field podcasting. I think I think that that would be appropriate 100%. in my mind. Yeah, yeah. 100%, not, not, I completely I completely agree. Yeah, we can, and not during the hurricane season, and the water temperature no. definitely need to be a little warmer. Um, but uh, yeah, we'll go down there yeah. in, the win in our winter. We'll go down there in the our, winter, and we'll have a we'll we'll good time. We'll do our, our island podcast journey. Absolutely, <laughs> I think everybody everybody would everybody would enjoy that one. But uh, no, it was it was it was uh, it was a good it was a, it was a it was a really really informative thing. As I said, I've known Ivy a little bit. I uh, actually know her quite a bit for quite a number of years now, and Rachel. And I, I want to encourage people, if you haven't heard Rachel Graham's uh, episode, go back and check it out. I believe it was in 2022 we had her, uh, her yeah. podcast episode on. And uh, check it out, and you can hear all about how Mar Alliance actually got up and got started on, got started, and then uh, Ivy came on board there right around when Rachel was starting it. And uh, fascinating thing. I mean, there's two really fascinating people have kind of really kind of stepped to the beat of their own drum in life. And, uh, I really think yeah. I really encourage people to, to listen to it, especially if you're look, you're a young person starting out and you're thinking, what are you going to do? Just listen to li hear Ivy's story. It's just, it was pretty amazing. It's definitely something one to one to listen to. And, and you can also go to Mar Alliance, Dot org. So maralines.org, we'll put it in the show notes. Um, but this has been so great. We'll put all the contact info we need to, to put it in there uh, for, for Ivy. And Dave, if people want to get a hold of you, how would they do so? 
Uh, it's a uh, Lost Shark guy on Instagram. Please follow, and then Lost Sharks on Facebook, and Lost Shark guy on on X. And um, yeah, please go subscribe to the podcast, and we'd like to hear from you. Please send us some comments. Awesome. And if you want to go to our YouTube channel and subscribe, you can do so. The link's in the show notes. Uh, but other than that, thank you guys so much for listening to this. And thank you, Ivy, for making yourself available and being so flexible uh, on this island time that you're, that you're working with and the, the cutting of internets and power and so forth. But we really appreciate it. And, Dave, thank you so much again. Uh, and everybody who listens, thank you. We, we really appreciate you listening. We really appreciate you getting a lot of out of this. So if you know someone who might be able to get a lot out of this as well and looking, looking to go into a career in shark science or shark conservation, please share this episode with them and share the podcast with them. So thank you so much for joining us on this episode of the Beyond Joss podcast. Have a great day. We'll talk to you next time and happy conservation.